Hello? Hello. Hello. For those uh, two or three of you who don't know who I am, uh, I'm Scott Bierman, and I uh, am president of Boy College for like the next 48 hours. Um, so it is my honor to welcome you to the highlight of Weisberg Week at Boyd College, the keynote address by Dr. Wayne Au, the 23rd Weisberg Chair in Human Rights and Social Justice. Dr. Au, it's really wonderful to have you here. I very much enjoyed our conversation uh, this morning. Uh, and welcome to the Weisberg Auditorium, one of the great visionaries in my 40 plus year career in higher education was the inspiring Marvin Weisberg. This auditorium is named in his honor. Every time I step into this space, I think of his big smile, his even bigger laugh. Marvin had like the greatest laugh in the history of the world and his enormous heart. But I also think about his unwavering commitment to making the world a little more just and equitable on the pathway to making it a little bit better. The Weisberg Foundation, which he founded, has a well-established track record as being one of the most effective and cutting edge foundations in the United States supporting racial equity. It's a big honking deal. For the last 24 years, Beloit College has been a partner with this amazing foundation and a full generation of Beloit students, faculty, and staff have been the principal beneficiaries. How lucky are we? Please join me in thanking Trustee Nina Weisberg, class of 90, 1984, the leadership at the Weisberg Foundation, and Marvin Weisberg, who, although no longer with us in person, resides steadfastly within a warm corner of my heart. I know there are many in the room who feel exactly the same. These friends of Beloit College make the Weisberg Week possible. <laughs> Among other things, the Weisberg Program in Human Rights and Social Justice brings major speakers and events to campus, as well as offering scholarships to female Beloit students from Cambodia, Liberia, and Guatemala. Scholarships for low-income students to access study abroad grants for summer internships and a postgraduate fellowship for students to take their first steps towards a career in human rights and social justice. Dr. Au's residency is part of a year-long focus on the theme of intersectionalities, building our shared future. This theme and related programming emerged out of a fruitful retreat last year led by Dr. Sonia Johnson and Dr. Daniel Borowski. Please join me in thanking Sonia and Daniel. And please join me in recognizing some of the key people in bringing this theme to life and into action. They include Joseph DeRosier in Modern Languages and Literatures, Daksha Howard in Student Success, Equity, and Community, Emily Seiber in Advancement, Ron Watson in Health and Society and Political Science, Caitlin Rosario Kelly, Director of the McNair Scholars Program, Kelly Leahy in the library, Taya Pope, formerly with Upward Bound, Maris Capacci, Director of Student Excellence and Leadership, Amy Sarno in Theater and Dance, Liesl Walsh in Greek, Latin, and Ancient Mediterranean Studies. Thank you all so much. Uh, uh, Maria Scarpazin, thank you. And co-directors of the Weisberg, Pro Weisberg Program are Dr. Gloria Bradley, Assistant Dean for Student Success, Equity, and Community, and Josh Moore, Senior Director of the Global Immersive Learning Program. Thanks so much to the leadership from both of you. This year, this year, as part of the thematic programming around intersectionalities, Beloit College students have met the Owsley Scholar in Residence, Maria Parker, about the arts of hip hop and civic engagement, the Ivan Stone lecturer, Michael Woldemarium, speaking about US Africa foreign policy and taking a course with Caitlin Rosario Kelly based on the National Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity Project. We are delighted 
to have Dr. Wayne Au on campus to round out this year's programming uh, with a week focusing on teaching for social justice. To introduce you more properly to Dr. Au, I welcome Dr. David Segura, Assistant Professor of Education and Youth Studies. Off to you, David. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I would please to announce uh, and introduce Dr. Wayne Now. He was the 23rd uh, Annual Weisberg Chair in Human Rights and Social Justice. He's currently a professor and interim dean in the School of Educational Studies at University of Washington Bothell. He's previously also served as interim dean of diversity and equity in the campus and is also on the ed editorial board for Rethinking Schools, which is an awesome nonprofit uh, publisher aiming at supporting and strengthening public education as well as supporting um, and amplifying the, the voice of teachers and activists in education. Um, his academic work has focused on critical pedagogy, multicultural education, and critiques of high stakes testing, and include four authored, co authored, and co edited books that are a mix of academic work as well as curricular materials for supporting teachers as they build and expand um, on their own critical and anti racist teaching. Um, originally from Seattle, Dr. Al studied at UC Santa Cruz and Evergreen State, where he also worked as an educator for Upward Bound before becoming a high school teacher in ethnic studies, English, and social studies in Berkeley, California. And he went on to complete his, his doctoral studies uh, not too far from here at UW-Madison. It is with my great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Wayne Now. Uh, thank, you, thank you, David, and, um, and, and thank you, uh, Scott. It was, it was, I really appreciate it. Um, also, I want to give thanks to the Weisberg Foundation and to the folks who brought me here. It was, you know, uh, Josh and, and Gloria and, and Sonia and everyone. Like, it's, it's been... Um, really wonderful to be here and um, sort of uh, take a lot of learning um, uh, at here, here at Beloit. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting time to be a teacher, and so it's partly why I'm wearing my, my legalized teaching t-shirt today um, for this. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be thinking about how do we understand what sort of a, um, a politics of justice looks like when we think about classroom teaching. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, what it, a particular vision of teaching for social justice, and um, and and see so you all. When everyone came in, you should have gotten like uh, a couple pieces of paper and maybe a name tag. Uh, please don't put your actual name on the name tag. Okay, this is just in prep for we're gonna we're gonna do a little activity. Um, I'm gonna try and do a little praxis uh, around uh, a little embodied le learning uh, for 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 this uh, keynote. Um, but it's been great to get it's been great to get a chance to come back to Wisconsin and sort of um, you know be in proximity to where I went to grad school. I even was able to make a trip up there and and go see um, you know some friends and my old my old advisor up at UW Madison. So that was that's been really lovely. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm going to start now though with sort of let's let's sort of uh, some broad strokes of like what's the landscape we're we're dealing with. Um, right now in, in terms of thinking about um, K-12 public education and the, just the politics of education that we're dealing with right now. So first things first is um, I, always, I really want to be clear, like it's always good to, to pause and just kind of reflect like, you know, we're dealing with, you know, year three of the pandemic. And even though it's been declared to be gone, it really isn't. I mean, COVID's still floating around everywhere and long COVID and all sorts of things going on. Um, but, but uh, you know, it's been a time of extreme duress for a lot of, for a whole host of reasons. Um, you know, I know we're seeing both in K-12 and in higher education, um, the uh, levels of, um, you know, social, emotional, um, mental health issues facing a lot of students, a lot of teachers, a lot of faculty, and it's sort of impacting things like attendance and all sorts of stuff. So um, I think it's really important. Um, and, uh, and, and it's really sort of pressurized a lot of the struggles around uh, education and, 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 you know, uh, sort of raise questions about what's the role of schools um, in, in society. And we've kind of seen what I feel like a push to, like, open up schools and, and, have, and make sure basically schools as sites of childcare as much as anything else so that parents could get back to work, right? Um, and we know that the, the disparate impacts of, 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 of the pandemic have been hitting the poor, marginalized, and dispossessed um, the hardest. 
Oh, yeah. Sorry, before I keep going, I meant to thank everyone. Just, I want to thank you all for coming here. I know the weather, storms, people are on t tornado, tornado watches and all sorts of things happening. Also, I hear that, uh, you know, today is uh, National Trans Visibility Day, and so we want to uh, honor and recognize that. But that also means that um, um, uh, tr uh, I think it's drag, it's, it's drag bingo is happening right now, and so which means you all made the choice to come here instead of going to a super fun drag bingo thing, and I really ap appreciate that. Um, although that probably would have been a lot more fun um, than this. Um, anyways, okay, so and then so so dealing, coming out of the pandemic and sort of recognizing the reality of the situation. Um, so then, what's going on in across the U.S. right now? So, uh, 42 states have tried to ban something that they believe is "quote unquote" critical race theory, um, and I have to put it in quotation marks and put that parenthetical that says well, what they believe it to be. Now, to be clear. Most of these jokers trying to ban critical race theory, probably 99% of them don't know what critical race theory actually is, and they've labeled all sorts of things um, uh, to be critical race theory, things like social emotional learning, which is the furthest thing from critical race theory, or inclusive education, or just broad terms like diversity, right? Like, these things aren't connected to critical race theory at all. Um, they might be within the same cloud of like multicultural education or something, but very, very different, and um, it's been, it's, it's just been inflated and conflated in so many ways with so many different things. Um, we're seeing books being banned in many states. Um, in, 22, in 2022, over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills uh, were inter have been introduced or were considered in various U.S. states. Uh, we're seeing violent right-wing attacks on drag queen story hours at libraries and other, and other spaces. Um, we're, uh, uh, discussions of gender identity and sexual orientation have been banned in some states. Um, and oh, we're going to talk about Florida in a minute. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, LGBTQ affirming books are being taken out of classrooms and libraries. And we're even seeing some uh, conservative politicians um, using the language of eradication for, for trans and, que and queer students. It's like, and we, I mean, we need to really sit with that, right? Like, what does it mean to say eradication of, of, of a particular body and what, the, what that physically looks like? And um, um, it's, it's uh, really, really disturbing. Um, some other spaces, Iowa is trying to push a full-blown uh, school voucher program. And for those of you who aren't familiar with school vouchers, that's the idea that um, parents could take sort of, uh, you know, sort of a sort of a think of a coupon of your state of your of your public public funding from the state and give that to whichever school you want to give it to. Um, but that includes uh, private schools, private religious schools in particular, and, and start raising some questions around, um, you know, should uh, public money be able to be spent on um, uh, religious institutions and separation of church and state and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's setting aside the issues around sort of free market approaches to education and, 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 and those kinds of issues that are raised by voucher programs. Um, you know, Missouri had a bill banning CRT, and then they, tr then they were trying to figure out how to pay teachers uh, money to take courses in teaching patriotism, right? Um, that was one that came up on, like, Daily Show a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was wor the kind of worth no noting as well. Um, and basically, a Texas governor recently proposed ending tenure after university, uh, uh, af it was a couple days after the university faculty in Texas affirmed their right to teach CRT as, as a, an intellectual and political concept, right? And think about that, ending, ending tenure, right? And for the university faculty in the room, we, like this is one of the things that we sort of hold on to as, as a way that we could have political speech and not have to worry about losing our jobs because of that speech. Um, and it's one of the sort of core things about a higher education that I think is important, and it's definitely, definitely under attack. And just this week, because they, they knew I was going to give this talk, <clears throat> I've talked about this. I've visited several classes and had a chance to talk with many students here at Beloit, and I really appreciated that opportunity to learn from you all and, and understand this context um, a lot better. But um, uh, Waukesha School, uh, uh, Waukesha, a school in Waukesha banned um, the singing of Rainbow Land from their elementary school uh, musical, okay? Um, it's a first grade class and it's actually one of my close friends. Uh, she's a former editor at Rethinking Schools and she and I have worked on a couple a book together and some other stuff. Um, her name is Melissa Temple and this kind of blew up just this last week. It's been on CNN, she was supposed to be on like with Don Lemon and People Magazine and all this kind of stuff. Um, um, but basically, you know, her first graders were going to sing Rainbow Land. They love the song, right? It's a, and it's a song by Dolly Parton and Miley Cyrus. And, uh, and um, 
someone complained and they thought it was, they thought it was too threatening to have the song Rainbow Land, uh, given all the sort of anti, uh, uh, anti-queer politics that are flowing around. And so then they were told they can't do it. And so it's, it's kind of blown up and it's kind of been, been making, making the rounds, right? But think about that, right? Like, here's a first grade teacher who wants her first graders to sing Rainbow Land. And it's not that controversial. It's just a song about inclusion. Um, but that's, even that becomes too much in this kind of context. Uh, so let's talk about Florida a little bit. <clears throat> I think we need to start using the word fascism a little more openly now. I, people hesitate to do that because you think about fa- the word fascism, we think about maybe um, uh, you know, Hitler and, and World War II, but the kinds of stuff that's, ha- that, that's happening uh, in Florida really starts to evoke that set of politics, um, a really hyper-authoritarian hyper-author- state that is um, uh, clamping down on so much uh, political speech and free speech um, and educational speech, right? And so in Florida, they had the Stop Woke Act, um, which bans discussions of anything related to diversity, CRT, equity, and inclusion, anything DEI related, basically. Um, and then, then there's the big fight about the, advance, the African American Studies Advanced Placement Tests. Um, and this is a really important piece that I've talked with a lot of students about, because what happened was, um, college board and, and the folks, uh, the college board who, who handles the advanced placement exams um, ended up uh, basically editing their, the AP African American Studies exam uh, literally just to whitewash it. They took, out, they took out all these things that they thought, that, that folks in Florida thought were uh, offensive um, and really sort of um, sterilized it in many ways um, before rolling it out. And the reason why it's important is because, you know, something like AP ends up being you know, that's, that's what everyone in the country takes. And so essentially what happens now is we have everyone who's taking the, the AP African American Studies exam is, is taking, um, uh, the, they're, like, they, they're taking the exam, they're taking the Florida version of the exam. That's for everybody. So Florida's basically setting the curriculum around AP African American Studies for the entire country, um, um, which I think is something is problematic and we need to be um, thinking about. Um, yeah, so DeSantis has vowed to go after universities and professors teaching diversity. Um, universities are getting rid of anti-racist statements. Uh, folks are removing books out of libraries and classrooms. Uh, the DeSantis is moving to try and shut, close down like gender and women's studies programs, trying to end all DEI programs, also trying to work on ending tenure, right? So this is, a, this is the state of what's going on in Florida. Um, and it, it's sort of, it's one sort of very, I don't know, intense example of, of sort of what's going on, what can go on politically. Um, here in the U.S. right now. So then what do we do about all this, right? You're like, oh man, Dr. House coming out with just the most depressing talk ever, right? I'm I'm not going to be a teacher, and why, like, what's going on? Um, That's okay. I always end on a hopeful note, and we're going to get there. Um, So so then how do we bring, like, how do we operationalize then? If we're going to think about what it means to teach against all this, right, and teach for social justice, right, teach in ways that supports anti-racism, that supports Black Lives Matter in schools, teach in ways that are, that's queer and, and, and gender affirming for however anyone identifies, right? Um, um, how, how do we understand that and from a really practical K-12 perspective? So what I'm gonna ch- go do now is, oh, are we about to have a tornado warning? <laughs> oh, we had one, okay. <clears throat> so what, uh, what I'm gonna do now is kind of yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we are probably in the safest place in the building. So what I want to do is work through um, uh, sort of what are sort of generally sort of rethinking schools, tenants around teaching for social justice. And, and just to give you a, a brief history, um, rethinking schools is now around 35 years old. It's, it's, it was started by teachers in Milwaukee um, who really wanted to figure out how to do, like they were reading, <clears throat> they're reading critical scholars like Henry Giroux and going, what is this guy talking about? And what does this have to do with how I, how I teach on a daily basis? We need to do our own thinking about how to do social justice and critical pedagogy in classrooms. Um, and so they got together and they started, they started producing a newspaper, you know, and for the younger people in the audience, newspaper was actual print and, you know, it would rub off on your fingers. It was black and white. Um, and a whole, whole, it was a whole other old technology at this point. Um, oh, okay. Is that a more serious one? <laughs> okay. I'm just going to keep talking. Um, but if a tornado comes, let me know. Um, <laughs> and, and so Rethinking Schools has really grown and become a national influence on, on um, effective practice for teaching for social justice. Um, you know, our books 
and magazines are assigned in teacher education programs around the country. Um, and uh, dang, that's all right. Oh, I know, I know. I'm not worried about that <laughs> at this point. <laughs> it was one of the reasons why I used to, it's like storm season in the spring in Madison used to make me, like, used to be so difficult because you just live with that. They'd be like, okay, you, we're tornado warning, and we're living with that for these hours. And you're like, wait a minute, okay? It's it, that kind of tension. Yeah. Right on. Okay, okay. Maybe we'll get some other people in the building to come down here and they can join, they can join the lecture, so. <laughs> Wouldn't be a trip to Wisconsin in March without a tornado warning, right? That's fine. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, so I'm gonna kind of work through um, some of the tenets of teaching for social justice that, that we speak, that we, that we use in Rethinking Schools, plus a couple additions as well. So, um, so the first one, and this is really the core concept, right? Is the idea that we need to be grounding our curriculum and our teaching in the lives of our students, right? Um, and this is, this is what the, this is like, probably I would say what the, like if, if I were to pinpoint like one of the biggest problems with the whole anti-CRT stuff and the banning of, of all multicultural stuff is that like what, what effect, those laws effectively do is they end up um, banning the identities of, of, of large portions of students from the classroom curriculum, right? And from the from the teaching and the pedagogy, um, and and so you're basically alienating and marginalizing huge, huge, huge swaths of, of, of young people. So, but when we, when we ground our curriculum and our teaching in the lives of our students, what we're doing is we're recognizing that their identities and who they are, and their communities, and their parents, and their histories, and their own community institutions, all those things are are important in our classrooms, right? And that means recognizing then sort of the complexity and the diversity of everything that they bring uh, 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 to, to our classroom spaces and making sure that they are seen in our curriculum and our teaching. Um, the second piece and is pedagogical, right? We believe very strongly in teaching through dialogue, right? Um, this, this kind of goes into the legacy of Paulo Freire and, and, you know, Freire wrote about a famous chapter about the banking style of education, which is the idea that teachers hold all the authority and the knowledge, and then students are blank slates or empty cups, and then as a, t as a teacher, we're just going to crack open your head, and we're going to pour the knowledge in your brain, um, and, and the students, you don't really have any, um, you know, you don't have any say in it, you don't have much power, you're just supposed to be the, re the receiver of, of the knowledge. But if we're going to teach for social justice, we've got to push against those kinds of dynamics, push against the, the, that kind of power differential and understand that learning actually happens through conversation, through dialogue, which is maybe a little ironic to say in the middle of a lecture on teaching for social justice, but we're, we're gonna get to the practice part too, so then, then we'll have some dialogue, I promise. And so right in line with everything I've been saying, then we wanna critically support students' identities. Our work needs to be there to support students, like we, we teach the students that are in front of us. If there's one thing that educators learn is that, you know, people can have all kinds of like, like, like it, it makes me, <laughs> I find it upsetting, right? Right now, we, there's all so much talk about learning loss, right? Oh, the pandemic and there was all this learning loss and then they're looking at test scores and all this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, as teachers, we do what we've always done. Like our students are coming to us with what they have, right? And they're coming to us as who they are and they're coming to us um, with whatever issues. In this case, I think right now we're dealing with a lot more, like I said, um, you know, mental health issues, socio-emotional issues. That's just part of the reality. And as educators, that's always, what, that's always what, what we do. We teach the student in front of us, at least if we're good educators, right? Um, and so which means we're, tr we're always supporting our students' identities and everything they're bringing with them um, all the time. Now, I added critically to this because I also think it's important to understand, like, you know, if I have a, um, you know, if I have a white supremacist kid come into my classroom, uh, I'm not going to uncritically support that particular identity. So I'm trying to think about the politics of those identities as well and try and develop student critical self-reflection around who they are and who they want to be in the world and what the implications of, of, of their uh, ideologies and, and viewpoints are um, as they move through the world. So again, you'll see, you can see the through line of the, of, uh, just going, going across all of this, right? And so then if we're, if we're, under, if we're take, we're grounding our uh, pedagogy in students' lives and we're supporting their identities, that means that we have to value 
home languages, right? Language is an expression of culture. Like, we know that through and through. And so um, one, of the, one of the best ways we can, we can support students in our classrooms is by supporting their, their languages. And so, you know, that means, that means lifting them up um, and, and, you know, uh, not, not understanding home languages in terms of deficit theories. We all so often get the idea, oh, this student's an uh, English language learner. They can't do this, right? No, that's not the case. Actually, uh, the, the kids who come in as, as uh, native speakers of other languages first, like they're bringing um, uh, way more, like so many more skills um, uh, to, to, to our classrooms, both in terms of their home language, they have their English language skills, and they have their translation skills, and all the cognitive stuff and the cultural stuff that comes with that as well. That's all what they're bringing, all that, and we have to recognize that as something powerful and something really to value um, in, in, our, in our students in our classrooms. And the other thing that we really like to focus on is the idea that, that our students are really capable of addressing political issues, social and political issues, right? So often we hear things like, oh, they're, they're kids. They can't, they can't understand that, right? Um, I mean, shoot, uh, uh, Dr. Segura and I were just talking about little kids and, and some of the research around, like, a lot of times folks are like, oh, you can't talk about race with a four-year-old. They're kindergartners. Like, they don't know anything about it. But if you look at the research on it, they are, at four years old, they are already getting racialized messages. And they're, they're, and they're having racialized understandings of different identities, even at that age. And so, it's true, I am not going to go teach critical race theory to a four-year-old, because that doesn't work. But we can talk about concepts of fairness, right? And, and, and talk about, um, uh, uh, there's, there's, we have great articles in Rethinking Schools around like, you know, how do you teach about skin color to, to little kids? And how do, you teach, how do you teach about different kinds of hair and, and, and loving ourselves and loving the diversity of who we are, right? So we can, we can engage on, with something like race and racism and even white supremacy in a way um, with, with, with young people uh, even, uh, but you just have to like, we have to scaffold it and we have to think about what are the core concepts that drive that. The other, and, and this also means that we also respect young people in a way as activists, right? Um, you know, we know, we, like we know that students, um, they, they'll, they'll write letters, they'll organize, they'll, as I'm gonna point out later, la later in my talk, they'll, they'll, they'll do walkouts and protests, right? Like, like students are thinkers and they're smart and they, they care about their world and so we should respect them enough to engage them in like real and serious issues in our curriculum. We also want classrooms to be spaces for really strong student engagement. And again, this is another pedagogical move, right? It's like um, we can't have sort of the lecture-based classroom all the time. I do believe in, in short lectures and good lectures. I, I, wanna, I wanna be clear about that, um, but very selective about, about that. Um, but there needs to be spaces where students can engage with each other, where they can engage with, with teachers and then where they can engage in materials and it's gotta be interactive in that space. And all that, be, all that becomes an issue in a way of sort of classroom, classroom environment. And, and for me, in other work I've done, um, other scholarly work I've done, I've argued that actually um, we should be defining curriculum in terms of how we structure classroom environments in ways that enable students to actually open up to learn something, right? Um, and so this, this piece really speaks to that, the importance of what, what, is our, what is our overall space and what does it invite in terms of, in terms of learning and interaction. Um, I edited this one a little bit. The old language, we used to have the word rigor. And just to recognize that rigor was impossible without it. I hate the word rigor, all right? Um, partly, part, part of me wants to think it's more about rigor mortis, right? Because uh, it's still defined, like, it's, it, like, the concept of rigor really, to me, really, like, sets things in stone. But, but you know, typically when we talk about rigor, um, it's, it's usually just means more work, frankly. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, it, doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean deep intellectual engagement, it often means like doing more reading or doing more writing or answering more worksheets or whatever. So I took that out and really just to understand that um, we, we would argue that you, you can't really have like a deep understanding of curriculum and the world and, um, and, and, and in terms of like how, how we go into learning about things that it actually, it actually requires that we uh, bring a politics and social justice into that, you know, and, and, and uh, I guess as I, so I think this is the next slide. I was, about to, I was about to jump ahead. But that means that it connects across the, the entire curriculum, right? Uh, teaching for social justice, bringing the politics of justice in education, um, 
you know, is, is, is something that can be, it's, it's, it's interdisciplinary. It can go across everywhere, right? Um, a lot of folks think, oh, um, although I know Segura talks about this in his class around mathematics. People think, oh, mathematics is, that's an objective subject. We, sh we can't, like, there's no politics in mathematics. You're like, no, wait a minute. There's all kinds of politics in mathematics. We can, you can get deep and philosophical about it. We can talk about, um, you, know, um, you know, some of the philosophies of knowledge around objectivity and, and posit positiv positivism and all that kind of stuff. But even more to the point about mathematics to those, we can talk about the multicultural histories of mathematics, different, different ways of approaching, um, um, you know, thinking about the world through numbers that different cultures around the world have, have, taken, have taken on and how they express their learning in, in, in those culturally grounded ways. Um, and then there's also the ways pat mathematics and quantitative literacy are used to understand the world and the politics of the world and the importance of that. So especially these days, I think having sort of a quantitative data literacy around, um, um, you know, understanding how, uh, how for instance, um, you know, uh, you know when, we, when we get like, you know, poll results or we, we, get, we get these translations of research saying, you know, um, this group of students does bad and this group of students does, does well and like we need some data literacy to really um, dig in through that stuff and so there, there is a way like, like, these po like the politics of justice should be in mathematics. Science is easy these days too. We can talk about environmental racism for days and days and days, especially with sort of the oncoming uh, enviro environmental disaster that we've all been beginning to experience, I feel like. Um, another piece, another core piece here is, is um, really taking the time to explore how social and economic and cultural institutions contribute to inequality. Now we want to name this very specifically. We think students should be learning about this like in, in very, very concrete ways, in large part because it's what they experience too, right? Um, you know, I think it's important that, that folks learn about, um, you know, for instance, I want students to learn about tracking, right? It's something that a lot of students experience, and I think they should be having, like, they should have that as part of their curriculum to see how, okay, how, how does a, how does a educational institutional policy contribute to, uh, you know, uh, segregation and, and other forms of educational equality related to race and class in a school? Same thing with high stakes tests. That's a conversation I've had with a lot of students in the last few days was about, well, they're like, well, what do we do? And I'm like, well, one thing we should be doing is we should be teaching our students about these tests and the issues with them so that they can understand the game, the particular game that they're, they're being required to play um, in their schools. And so, um, you know, there's so many angles we could go around this, around, you know, talking about white supremacy and institutionalized racism, um, you know, tre uh, treatment of, 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 uh, of queer students, um, you know, treatment of students with disabilities, all sorts of things, but, but really we want students to develop those kind of big picture institutional understandings, historical understandings of how our current uh, inequalities and equities um, kind of have come to be. And so there's a politics here where we want to also critique Eurocentric school knowledge, right? So we come from a, from a standpoint that, that recognizes that you know, um, our schools are, are essentially part of a settler colonial system and state, right? Um, and there's a historical commitment to Eurocentric uh, forms of knowledge and thinking um, within our curriculum. And we want to push, push back against that for all sorts of reasons. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, chief, chief among them just to say that if we're going to be anti-racist and we're going to recognize the multiplicity and complexity of our students and their communities, then um, we shouldn't be working within a Eurocentric norm. We need to be working within, at, at minimum, sort of a polycentric norm and having folks sort of understand the world from different lenses and different views. But, you know, we can't be like all anti, 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 right? So we have to also understand that we have to celebrate social movements and we need to, we need to like uplift you know, struggles against xenophobia and white supremacy um, and, and, and nationalism, nativism, as we're seeing it even expressed now in places like, like Florida um, and Texas, right? Um, and sometimes here in Wisconsin as well. Um, yeah, so we gotta record, like, that's the thing. You, we, it's, it's, you can't get stuck on the critique, right? Because if you do, then you just feel like, oh, like the world sucks and I just like, what am I gonna do? Um, and, and, and part of it is then we have to see like, people have struggled against this stuff for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's, it's an ongoing legacy that we are a part of when we do this work. Um, and what that does is then it helps students see themselves as possible change makers and sort of changes their horizon about what they, what they can do, what they think they can do um, uh, as, as um, 
you know, as participants, um, as Freire would say, as subjects in their own lives, right? They can be, they can be subjects to their own history um, and, and what, as, as, as folks going out to change the world and understand that they're more powerful than maybe they think they are. And I think this is really important because, again, in this country, we tend to downplay in our curriculum um, the fact that people are activists and they have done, done this work. Like that stuff doesn't get into the curriculum very much and, then, and because of that then it limits students' abilities to see what's possible for themselves. Um, and then this is another one I added. It wasn't on, it, like, I, this was not on the, uh, the original. Is that we need to be thinking about healing and joy and it, this really comes from, I think, the moves that have happened in, in um, uh, K-12 ethnic studies. Uh, there's been a real push for like how do we think about education in ways that can help address historical trauma, uh, community trauma, um, and really then how do we create class classroom spaces that, that can be like healing for folks, right? It's kind of a radical idea, um, you know, instead of talking about the, this oppressive classroom and oppressive curriculum, like how do we find healing um, and how do we make joy, you know, learning joyous, right? Um, I really appreciate that about your class, Sonia, the curative uh, class, the communities class, you know, we did a breathing exercise, like start class, and it's sort of like, it grounds you, it was a little bit of yoga and like, and, um, and, and it creates a kind of community and sort of brings us to a different space. And there's, sort of, there's a spirit of healing behind that, which is really important. Okay, so we're gonna do an activity, all right? Now, I, I understand that we are in an auditorium, so I don't want you to get up and run around or fall downstairs or do anything like that. But um, we're gonna do something called the um, race and gender justice scavenger hunt, all right? Now, all of you should have a, uh, a, a small sheet that's a roll, something very short and small. And you should also have a name tag, perhaps. And you wanna write the name of your roll on your name tag, okay? And basically what I'm gonna ask you to do is to take a moment and read your roll. Actually, let me, I'll wait a sec, people are still flipping, so I gotta step back to the classroom teacher in me. So take a moment and read your roll. Write, if, you, if you have a pen, I know some of us don't have pens or anything, but if you have a pen, write, your name, write the name of your roll on your name tag. Go ahead and put that on. That's your, that's your temporary identity for the moment. And then rather than get up and move around, and we're gonna do it, we're, just, we're doing like a mini version of this, of this little activity, okay? Rather than get up and move around, what I'd like you to do though, although you all might have to get up and move around, um, is to just turn to the people next to you or behind you or in front of you, right? We're just in your seat, stay in your seats, that's cool. Um, and um, and see, how, see, what, see how many of the questions you can answer on the question sheet, okay? So we'll go ahead and go, we'll let this go for a few minutes. Give it a shot. Oh, and if, if, if you, one rule, of, if you meet yourself, just move on to someone else, by the way. <laughs> I'm just putting some samples up here of, of some of it, kind of for the live stream so they can see what we're doing.
All right. Uh, okay, okay. I think, I think you've got enough for a little taste of this, so we'll go ahead and, and bring it back. All right. Hope, I hope this was just to get a little taste of, 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 of a sort of a typical sort of rethinking schools style teaching for social justice kind of activity. This is clearly an introductory exercise. It's not like we expect folks to be experts suddenly in, in all these different characters. Um, I suppose some of you, uh, probably a lot of you came to this keynote and did not expect to be able to be Elizabeth Cady Stanton or be I don't know, you know, Fred Korematsu or maybe Queen Little Kalani or somebody. Um, but you got to be them for, for, for a couple minutes just to, just to feel it out. Um, anyway, so how about this? Uh, let's see. Anyone out here? Let's, uh, who, 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 was someone, who here was someone who had to spend, who spent time in jail for their beliefs? You were? Oh, who, who were, oh you were Scott. You were, oh, you were Fred Korematsu. Yes, yes. So Fred Karamatsu and, uh, uh, resisted the, the curfew for Japanese Americans during World War II, and he got, he got arrested. All right. Uh, let's see. Who's someone in here who worked against slavery or other forms of racism? Yes, you in the, is, it, is that a Diamondbacks hat? Diamondbacks hat. Ah, William Lloyd Garrison. Now, who was William Lloyd Garrison? Yep, absolutely. Crusader against slavery, advocate for women's, for women's rights. Um, which also could be the next one too, right? That was someone who's advocate for women's rights. Um, and then uh, here's a good one to always use to chew on. Who believed violence was necessary for justice? Anyone in the room? Go ahead. Ah, you're Malcolm X, right? By any means necessary and, and trying to think through how do we, how do we resist white supremacy um, and, and by whatever means we, we need to, okay? Uh, what about nonviolence? Someone have someone who used nonviolence in their work? Yes. Right, Henry Thoreau didn't pay taxes and and because he didn't support the war. Um, who who met or was someone that you'd never heard of before? It's okay to admit that. All right, all right. How about here? We'll go over here. Oh, the Gimke, yeah, uh, the Grimke sisters. Yep, absolutely. Okay, that's one. All right, what another one? Oh, yeah, Bernice Regan. Yep, okay, okay. Yeah, so, oh, sure. Marcus Garvey. All right, all right. Go ahead, both of you. Okay, Susan B. Anthony and Leonard Peltier. Okay, good, right? So, wow, see, there's a lot of important people to, to learn. that, And I would argue that this list, this isn't even the full list of, of the roles, but this list is kind of a beginner's list, frankly. And so if you start to study this stuff, you're gonna, there's a whole bunch more folks you could be, you could be picking up, all right? Um, and then what about, oh, let's see, we'll skip that one about who you have heard before. Uh, white person who worked for racial justice in the room, please. Har Harvey Milk, okay, right on, a ab absolutely. Harvey Milk, very famous. There was a movie um, uh, uh, prominently known as a gay, gay rights activist from San Francisco, um, but uh, also worked for racial justice. Um, so you can see what this does, right? Oh, sorry, go ahead. John Brown, yeah, 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 and, and that's been a little, made a little more famous because of the Showtime series, I think, if any of you watched it. It's actually pretty good. I mean, you know, it was all right. It was entertaining. Um, fictionalized, of course, but entertaining. Um, uh, and we could have, there's conversations about John Brown and uh, whatever. There's complex political conversations to have around John Brown. But, so I hope you get to see what this kind of does. There's so much work going on in this kind of activity, right? So already, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a kind of engagement that happens, right? It's the energy in the room changed. You all stopped listening to like me just blabber on about all these politics and education and stuff. Suddenly you were up and around, people were talking. I saw a lot of smiling, a lot of like en engaged activity. Um, uh, folks, you know, learning, talking to each other, learning about new people, like all, all of it just shifted. And then the content of it was, you could see like for a lot of you, there was a, there was a lot of folks who answered the one about, you know, someone you'd never heard before, right? There was all this kind of learning going on. Um, in, in this space as well, uh, kind of all within this politics of like trying to, uh, trying to build our knowledge around issues of justice and, and stuff around uh, folks' different identities. Um, so this is a very sort of typical rethinking schools thing. Uh, for all of you future, current and future teachers in the room, I would say this kind of activity is, uh, is, is great for any introductory activity. So um, 
Um, like when I used to, like if you're teaching a novel, which you do, sorry, I, you know, I, teach, I teach methods, or I used to teach methods courses, so I can't, I can't stop myself from this. Um, like if you teach a novel, what you do is you take all the major characters, right, and write small blurbs like that, and then you have a, have, have a, have a meeting and have everyone try and meet each other, right? And that introduces students to the novel and makes it a way, a way to sort of open up and get into it. You can do it for historical events. There's all sorts of stuff you can do it for. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really good activity that sort of really represents uh, basically almost all the things that um, I laid out around the Rethinking Schools model. Oh, sorry, I meant to put this up while we did it. Okay. Um, so I also, to, to end things on up, up note, I want to have a few slides. I just want to talk about like, so then what are teachers doing then, right? We have this classroom practice that I just, we just kind of did here. Um, but what are teachers doing to like push back on um, these regressive politics that folks are, are experiencing? And there's, and there's lots of examples. Students are, students are resisting, teachers are resisting, parents are resisting. That was one of the beautiful things. Uh, I didn't say it at the time, but you know, my friend in Waukesha uh, with the Rainbow Land song, she's got a group of parents up there who are fabulous. And they are supporting her so strongly, supporting all of the um, LGBTQT work that she's been doing in that school. Um, you know, it's, it's been amazing. And so like, parents are also supporting this work and, and fighting it back um, against a lot of these regressive politics. Um, just some examples and things to look at. Um, you know, a quick Google search will show you that, you know, um, just in the last year alone, uh, students have protested um, anti-LGBTQT laws in Virginia, Kentucky, Iowa, Oklahoma, Florida, Arizona, Utah, California, South Dakota, Missouri, Texas, and Vermont, right? And it was great, to me, it's great to look at that list because if you didn't look, you, you might not have known. And now it's like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, that's a lot of states. And these are walkouts, right? When students walk out, it's such a critical thing, like we're so, um, we, as in, in education we get so institutionalized in a way that we feel like we can't break these rules, and a student walkout is a kind of a rule breaking that is really powerful and in many ways I would just say really liberating. Um, and to see students, you know, our whole, our whole younger generations now and their, their um, sensibilities around sexuality and gender and, and queerness is so expansive. And it, this kind of stuff just shows me that, like, you know, all these folks passing these, trying to pass these laws, they're just out of touch with the reality of, of where the majority of the population is. But, but unfortunately, those folks actually have the power to, like, push through on those laws. But, but you know, I see this stuff, I'm like, ah, oh, the kids are going to be all right, you know? Um, K-12 ethnic studies, there's an ongoing movement. It's been going for a while um, to bring ethnic studies into K-12 classrooms, okay? And there's really great work happening. Um, it, it ends up being a focus on sort of decoloniality, um, anti-coloniality, anti-racism, but also focusing on like indigeneity and, and, and healing from trauma, like there's a whole thing going on. And so there's folks doing workshops around the country, doing professional development. Um, a lot of it comes out of uh, uh, Tucson and the Mexican American Studies program, but it's not just there. There's great Asian American Studies stuff happening in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Amazingly, in Seattle schools, I don't know if we're the only district in the country, but we might be. Like, we just started a Filipino-American studies class uh, in, in Seattle public schools, right? Um, and that's, it's, it's amazing. So there's this whole thing happening, but it's kind of bubbling under the surface, and it's not in the media. It's not like you would know this is going on. Um, but there's, there's folks, like, like, in major cities doing this work. Um, in response to the, in response to the, uh, all the sort of repressive laws and legislation around um, around what's happening K-12, around teaching diversity and equity and anti-racism and teaching against white supremacy. Um, there's been a whole push by the Zen Education Project, which I really want to like, make sure folks know about. Uh, the Zen Education Project is named after Howard Zinn, um, the late uh, radical historian. Um, it's a project that's, that's jointly um, sort of handled by um, rethinking, rethinking Schools and Teaching for Change. Um, and they've had a whole push around uh, teach the truth. Right? And that's been the response to um, the anti-CRT stuff, is to say, well, you all are you're you're trying to lie about, about racism and white supremacy and all this other stuff in the country, and we want, we want to encourage teachers to teach the truth. And so there's a whole pledge and, and uh, the materials and sort of a syllabus, like this points out, um, around that stuff. So part, part of that campaign is also teaching the black freedom struggle, right? Um, and, and there's, uh, you know, the Zen Education Project is doing classes, 
Um, they're offering resources and really trying to support teachers uh, in, in the work. Um, if, you know, that if you want to, if you, if you want to resist, um, you know, these, these regressive uh, policies and you need some curriculum and you want some uh, professional development on how to do that work, then like these folks, um, these folks are doing it. I um, also want to highlight the Black Lives Matter school movement, all right? And, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's an actual week. Usually, usually it's um, uh, in February during Black History Month where they have a week of action. And there's folks around the country, different school districts around the country. The national group is located, is sort of centralized in Philly, but it is a national, it is a national group. Um, and it's really like how do we sort of operationalize and how do we um, um, bring, um, you know, the politics of Black Lives Matter um, and, and as sort of as a movement and, and as, a, as a, a pushback against white supremacy and a pushback against anti-blackness, what is, and then bring, how do, we, how do we do that in classrooms? And so there's a whole curriculum online, um, there's, there's folks you can coordinate with and work with, um, and, that, and that's happening. Okay, so a couple final considerations. Oh, one other thing, I guess I, let me see, I'll go back to this. Um, as part of this, one thing I forgot, there's actually a whole series of study groups. So uh, a book I co-edited um, with uh, dear friends, Jesse Agopian and Diane Watson. Jesse is an uh, activist and teacher in Seattle, um, and he's on staff as an education project, and Diane Watson um, currently is a diversity head at a school, and um, they're both editors at Rethinking Schools, but we did a book called Teaching for Black Lives that we co-edited together, and so right now, the Zen Education Project is actually sponsoring teacher study groups across the country, um, and so teachers can apply, like, send an application and say, hey, we want to do a study group, um, and then they get free copies of the book, and then um, they're also, then, then uh, Zen Education Project will convene meetings, um, they'll usually have me or Jesse or Diane come and talk to teachers and sort of frame things out, talk that through, and then they have, then they have regular meetings as they work through that book, Teaching for Black Lives, and truly trying to think about how to, how to, how to extend this work into the classroom. And that work's actually being funded um, by, like, there's a, a handful of, like, some sports stars in the Seattle area and even a couple of celebrities um, uh, supporting that work, which uh, has, has been really good. Um, it's funny, like, a lot of people hate on Macklemore, but actually, like, Macklemore's given a bunch of money to, like, Teaching for Black Lives and some of the work. Um, so at least trying to put some of the money where, where his mouth is. But also some other folks, like some Seahawks, like Seahawks coach Carroll and um, a, couple, a couple players like uh, Doug Baldwin and, and Bobby Wagner and stuff like that give money as well. So a couple final considerations, and then I want to open up for some questions maybe. And I think Scott had a couple words to say at the end too, right? That's was what I heard. So... Um, Part of me just wants to say, and this is why I really like doing the activity we did, if folks are going to try and sort of both sides us, right, we get that a lot, like, we got to teach both sides, which is kind of ridiculous. I'm like, wait, so, you know, the extreme I always take it to, and, and I always do this because it just, like, drives it home with folks, is just say, wait, so you want to you teach both sides of the Holocaust? Like, is there both sides, right? Or you want to teach both sides of, like, the mass enslavement of African American, of Africans, you know, during, during chattel slavery? Um, like, there's no both sides to those things, right? But we still get some pushback around that. Well, oh, we got to teach both sides. It's a controversial issue. I'm like, all right, you know, let's ditch both sides, but let's drown them in complexity. Like, the activity that you did around the social, racial and justice, uh, racial and gender justice scavenger hunt was really about the complexity of politics and, and um, really kind of showed, like, this you get to see this range of how, how folks respond to oppression. Um, and so that is one, one sort of, I don't want to say antidote, but strategy for pushing back on some of those simplistic both sides arguments. And I want to be clear right now, we got to understand the risk, okay? I'm not naive or romantic about, about these things. Um, you know, I've, when, when we put out Teaching for Black Lives, you know, I started getting hate mail. Um, there was some cat in Wisconsin, actually had his actual address, and was sending me stuff. Um, and, and, you know, I get emails and whatever. And, and so, like, and, and we know, we see it, right? We see, the, we see the, the protests of school board meetings and folks getting violent and screaming and that kind of stuff. So, like, there's risk. And so I, I want to be, re like, really real about that and, and understand that, you know, we're in a moment in history where um, um, we need to really assess what it means to, like, teach for justice, right, which is kind of sad. Um, um, but that's not an argument not to do it because part of me also says because we're in that moment in history is the reason why we really have to do it. Okay, we can't just be quiet, we can't just cow down in the face of all this. And then, um, related to that then, is that you have to build community. You can't go out and do this work by yourself. You gotta, you gotta find other educators, find parents, find folks who you can organize with, 
um, build these networks and, and, and you know, find the, the curriculum stuff I put up here, like, get, you know, go check out Zen Education Project, go find those other teachers. There's always folks everywhere who are supportive of this kind of work, and you gotta build those relationships and build those networks, because um, that'll help you survive uh, the moment and help you, give you some more power as, as you do this work. Um, and I always, you know, nearby, relatively nearby in Chicago, they always have a social justice curriculum fair. Um, in fact, apparently, it's in November, yeah, 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 and like, I didn't remember, but, but uh, Dr. Segura and I met back when I was a doc student, like, I don't know, 20 years ago probably or something like that, 15, 18 years ago. Um, yeah, great, great space, and you go there and you're like, whoa, how many people come these days, you know? Hundreds come through, right? Yeah, yeah, and so like, you go there, you go to a space like that, and you go, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not the only one, right? And look, I can find my people, and it's really important to do that. It helps you uh, have the strength to, to carry on and move forward with things. So, All right, so that's my spiel for, for tonight. Thank you for listening and for engaging. I appreciate the time, y'all. Um, do I, We have some time to take a couple questions, I think, if that's all right. There's a, there's a mic or two moving around. I'm really happy to engage with, with, with some questions with folks. So one of the things that interested me most is for teaching social justice was uh, some of it's rooted in pedagogy. So I want to ask, uh, what are common teaching practices that root pedagogy and, you know, that support this anti-critical race theory, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah, so, so, so pedagogical practices that, that are resistant to that, to the anti-CRT stuff, yes? Yeah, so, or teaching practices that are settled in pedagogies that are against, so teaching practices in the classroom, yeah. Uh, you know, the structure and dynamics and how they support anti-CRT. Uh, Wait, how they support anti-CRT, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah so, so um, you know, you experienced one, right? I think that I did here a little bit, right? And, what, and the reason why I would say that's one of those, one, one pedagogical practice, like something like the scavenger hunt, um, is because if you think about it, it's, it's, it's something that, that, it's a, it, like, that asks you to, um, um, it asks you to like engage other human beings in your class in a way that ends up being active and actually starts to build towards community, right? And even, even, if, even if you just think about that, like uh, the idea that building community, right, and, and doing that through like an engagement around difference in politics, um, that in itself becomes a pedagogical commitment that I think is, that pushes back against the anti-CRT stuff, right? Um, so, so that to me is, would be a sort of a baseline thing. Anything that we do as, as, as core practices that's doing that, that's building community, getting folks to think critically about the world um, and, and figure out ways to engage each other in learning uh, around that. Um, so, you know, but, but that could be a lot of stuff, right? Um, you know, I would even say, okay, may, maybe writing an essay can do that, right? Or reading the right kind of books can do that too and having discussions in classrooms and working in small groups and doing, doing projects. A lot of the stuff that we already do can be that but, but it's how we frame it and then how we enter into that with, with students, I think. Yeah. Hi. Um, hello? Oh. Um, so I'm a first year and I know, I, I'm not sure what I really want to do yet, but I know education was like potentially that but there's like a lot of things that would deter me from that. Like obviously all of the things that like of states like trying to add, uh, end tenure and all that, but also like just the low pay already. <laughs> um, is there anything that you'd say you could, that's like a bit more hopeful that wouldn't deter me from <laughs> potentially pursuing that? Yeah, first thing I'd say is that we need you. Like if, if this is the stuff you care about and this is who you are, then we need people like you. We need you in the classroom in front of kids because you could be working to inspire a whole new next generation uh, to, do, to, to be amazing people, right? So that'd be the first thing I'd say to you. Um, that's the pep talk, at least. Um, what I would say, though, is that, that the one thing about teaching and education is it's highly localized. The conditions are different all over the place, 
right? And so, um, you know, if you go to, I don't know, go to, like, I, like, it, like it, just, it just depends so much. So, um, you know, my, one of my friends, you know, used to teach in a, in a really dense urban center, and, like, they lacked a lot of resources, and, you know, they weren't supporting students in special education and, and other, like, other issues related to just lack of resources. That was really bad. And then they moved to, like, a suburb to teach, um, uh, and suddenly they were like, whoa, like, yeah, there's all these resources, and, like, they felt supported in the work that they were doing and, and were able to do what they wanted to do, right? Um, or, you know, for me, in terms of thinking about the politics and stuff, you know, I, you know, there, there are plenty of schools where you can go, um, you know, where you, 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 you could have a very supportive principal who wants you to teach like this, right? Or a community that, that engages in, these, in this, kind of, this kind of thinking about the world, and it's very supportive of it. Just like you could also find a whole other school that could be the exact opposite, right? So it's very localized, and I, w my advice then is to say, become a teacher, but then also work really hard to like think about where you want to land and where you can land in a place that's going to be healthy for you um, as as a person and you know and a human being and, and a political being in, in the world. So, and pay pay differs drastically from district to district, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember once. Um, you know, in, in Seattle, I would say I was back back when I was a teach, public school teacher in Seattle. I would say the pay scale was low, but I, when I was a doc student, I was doing some research in in the Chicago suburbs. And when I found out like what this like veteran teacher got paid, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Like it was like more than some of my professors were getting paid back back at the university. So, yeah. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. And um, it was cool to see how the exercise in particular like brought the words into action. But I was wondering, you talk a lot about having open and like restorative conversations with students. Um, and I was wondering, I guess this goes to all ages, I think particularly in younger, more vulnerable ages, like how do you, when you have a student that comes in spouting like white supremacy, for example, um, how do you facilitate hard conversations without creating more harm? Like how do you protect uh, I don't know. How do you protect more vulnerable populations while also still allowing people to engage in conversation and toss back ideas? Yeah, that is a really hard one because, and, and, and it really depends on the level you're talking about teaching, right? I think at the university it's one thing. I think in, in high school it's one thing. In middle, sc like middle school is another thing. In elementary could be another thing. Um, and the difficulty is that as educators, like, as I said, you know, we got to take students where they're at, and students are at where they're at, and they might be in that space, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's really difficult. And then uh, harm can be done by what comes out of people's mouths, right? Um, and so there's, there's a few different things that I think folks do that I think is, that I think is good. Um, uh, part of it has, a lot of it has to do with, like, how do you, how do you head off um, the harm before before it can happen, right? Which has to do a lot with classroom norms um, and talking about okay, you know what, like like I, th I think it's I think it's perfectly fine for folks to be talking about um, you know what what kind of language is acceptable or not acceptable in the classroom space, for instance. Uh, there's some words that shouldn't be said, you know, in gen in general, and we need to be okay with that. I don't want folks using the N word in my class. I don't want you know like 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 that's a given, or, you know, the B word or anything else, right? Like, that stuff needs to be, some clear lines need to be drawn around that. Um, but then sometimes beliefs just come out, too, that have nothing to do with the specific yeah. language. Um, I used to teach in Southern California, my first university gig, um, down in Fullerton, Orange County. Orange County is probably as conservative as Florida. Um, and um, I remember I was teaching a multicultural education class um, and there's a, there's a very large um, conservative evangelical Christian community there. And, um, you know, I had a, a student in that classroom. We were talking about you know, LGBTQT students and rights and, and those issues and how to think about that as an educator. And I had someone raise their hand and literally just say, you know, and it's very, it's very coded language, but they said, well, what do you, like, like they basically said, why, like, like, so why wouldn't you, counsel a student out of a harmful lifestyle uh, if, you, if you knew it was going to be bad for them, right? Um, and it was, a, it was, so, so it was, a, it was a clearly homophobic, queerphobic comment, um, but without any of the derogatory language or anything involved in it, right? Um, and in that case, what was interesting is like, um, be, because of, I think, the community we had built in that space and the, and the curriculum work we were doing, actually, a lot of, it, would, it, wasn't, it, it didn't require me to intervene, 
because a lot of the students stepped up, right? And it got, it got kind of handled as, as a community issue. Um, and it was clear that that set of politics actually um, uh, wasn't welcome. But you see there's a thing there already, right? Like, like I can't, you know, we, we can't, I can't abide by like, like white supremacists or sexist or, you know, homophobic like, like language in my class, you know? And, and at least in public speech. Now maybe there's gotta be space created for private speech for folks to process that stuff and ask the kinds of questions they need. Um, but it can be really difficult. And so, like, I don't have an easy answer to that question at all. Super, super hard. Um, you know, because we are what we are, and we're all processing, and I want to have space for people to learn, too, right? Um, but on the other hand, I also don't want, like, I didn't want that super homophobic student to go become a teacher, either, because they might going to bring that into the classroom and then cause harm, harm there as well. So, um, not the best answer, but that, that, that's No, thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, it, it'll turn on. It's okay. weird. Yeah, they're weird. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that I'm a teacher right here in Beloit. I teach at Beloit Memorial High School. Um, and I have always felt that our school district here supports the work that you're talking about um, and that I've always felt supported in teaching for social justice right here in Beloit. So I want that, that person in the back who wants to be a teacher one day, I want him to hear that. So, um, but... My question is, um, despite that, I've always been surrounded by people who um, work from a place of fear, yes. um, who don't do what they maybe know or feel is right because they're afraid. Um, maybe they had a bad experience with a, a parent reaming them out or an administrator chastising them, or maybe they read about some lawsuit somewhere or they're reading about Florida. And so we have a lot of people who work from a place of fear. And I guess what, what advice would you have to those people who are operating from a place of fear and, and how, how do you encourage them to do the right thing? Yeah, I think uh, for me, again, context is everything, right? And so... Um, I think there are spaces where you do have to be careful, and I'm, I want to be thoughtful about that, right, and not, and just, I don't want to pretend that that's not real. Um, but again, I think it's like the last point here, right, like, if you, like, we, we get scared when we're alone, if we feel like we're alone, right, if you feel like no one has your back, and so, for me, the thing I want those teachers to understand is that they are not alone, right, and that there's, there's people in their school, there's people in their district, there's people around the country who actually uh, like support them and do the same thing. Um, now, you know, I can't account for like, maybe you have a really draconian principal who's gonna come at you no matter what, then you might have reason to be fearful, right? That, that's just the reality. On the other hand, if you're in that position, but you've got, you know you've got parents who got your back, then the principal might back off because parents are really powerful in, in school districts, right? Um, it's the same thing, parents will, you know, I've had parents come after me um, but I, my administrator had my back, so that was good. Uh, I also know that oftentimes, you know, it's, it's the angry so shopper syndrome, right? You always hear the folks who are angry about something, um, even though maybe the silent, sort of the silent majority over here is actually in support of what you're doing. So you gotta get those folks to not be silent anymore and let parents struggle with each other about, about what should happen in the classrooms too. I think it's a really important sort of community organizing take as well. Um, I believe in unions too, and unions gotta have your back too and help, help, help tremendously. I mean, you know, it's no, it's no mistake that Florida is a right to work state and, and they're able to push this stuff and have that conversation in the ways they are. So, but that's what a union is. A union is like, it, it's, it's a forced community in a way, right? It's like, like of, of folks who are bonded together by a contract and their profession um, and the rules that are there and that gives you an automatic backing as well. So I, to me, it's just, you gotta find people. You gotta find your people. That's all I keep telling people. When I'm teaching my future teachers at my university, I'm like, yeah, you gotta find your people. You gotta find your people. That's always the case. It's the only way you're gonna we're gonna survive this. Yeah. Maybe maybe just one more, and then uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so through all of this like discourse on um, on education inequity. Um, I understand that it, it, it can be really hard and it can be taxing emotionally. So I guess my question is like to someone who like really wants to do this work or, or is already doing this work, like 
what do you think is like the best way to kind of like um, not only self care but also like setting boundaries on um, on on like the work that they do at the time, like just kind of like for that person to sort of um, just like self care basically. Like like what is the best kind of strategy for that? Yeah, as educators, we're, we're, we are notoriously terrible at that, right? Like, we become educators because we, we love the work we do, we love the students that we work with, and we will kill ourselves, sometimes literally, to, like, to, to, to work. And, uh, sorry, I don't mean that. I don't want to make light of suicide, but I mean, like, from a health, from health perspective, heart attacks, strokes, whatever, um, you know, um, like, we, we, will, um, we, will, we will mess up our health like out of our commitment to activism, to education, to working with students. Uh, I'm guilty of that a as well. Um, for me though, I think, I mean, you said it. To me, it's like setting boundaries is just key. And, and it's hard to do, right? Like, you know, when a young person has something they need and they're asking you for it, how do you, you can't say no to that, right? And that's, re that's really, really hard. Um, I think as, as I've gotten older, I, I've, I've shifted a lot on, on that. I've, I've, you know, stopped answering emails after certain amounts of time. Um, and understood that, oh, the work will still be there on Monday when I get back, no matter if I answer that email on a Saturday or Sunday or not, right? Um, the work will still be there. And so I've had to draw those lines. Uh, frankly, um, you know, when, I had, when my son was born, that also brought a particular kind of focus to my life and may help me draw some of those boundaries too and understand what's important and, and what's not. Um, and so, but I, you know, there were times I burnt myself out of teaching because I was teaching and being an activist and all that together. Um, that was one of the reasons why I went to grad school, frankly, because I was like, I was, I just got too burnt out, like teaching 150 kids a day and doing like education activism on the side as my side gig, um, you know, but I also believe in exercise. I believe in all other, other forms of cultural practices, all these things, um, um, you know, help us keep going. Um, but don't make, edu don't make being a teacher your 24 hour job because that's just going to lead you, um, you know, down that path. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So first, uh, I'm gonna use this one. first of all, um, uh, I want to offer my personal thanks. So it's so great to have you here. Secondly, um, gosh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to have that many more times to say this. What amazing questions. And so it's so terrific to be here in this room. I'm so proud of the students at Beloit College. And uh, goodness gracious, one more time, you distinguish yourselves in such great ways. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being here tonight and, being, and making this event, honestly, that much more meaningful. So it's absolutely terrific. And, and thanks so much for, I mean, for you know, all the lecture pieces, but also the activity. I mean, there's, um, uh, you demonstrated what great teaching looks like. I mean, I don't know about others in this room, but I mean, I'm wearing my Fred tag, because uh, I'm, honestly, I'm really proud to have a moment being Fred. Uh, and I don't know about our little group over here, but um, I'm really proud of all my colleagues uh, that, uh, uh, and all your personas as, as well. So, I mean, what a great exercise. And I wish I was still teaching economics. I was thinking about, gosh, how would I teach a principles of economics course now and use this exercise? It's one of the first things in the uh, class that I, was, uh, that I was teaching. So now to what Josh really brought me up here for, which is, um, so how many times have you given a lecture during a tornado warning? Yeah, yeah, well, um, we thought something like this might happen. Um, so this, uh, this gold thing, it's hard to imagine I'm giving this to someone from Seattle, but this, uh, this uh, gold thing is a raincoat, uh, which uh, minimally you can use to get from here back to your hotel room. So thank you so much, thank you, uh, so much for being a part of this. Yeah. Yeah, so Wayne has a 13-year-old son, and my bet is that he will end up with this uh, and be wearing a Beloit College raincoat in Seattle, Washington, between now and the age that he's like 17 to 18, and then come to Beloit College. So I'd like to welcome your son to, in advance to Beloit College uh, in the not-too-distant not future. So one more time, big thanks for Dr. Al. Yep, hope you have a great evening. Stay safe. Uh, and if there's anything left of the drag show, go there. <laughs>